Welcome to In the Trenches, the podcast of the Michigan Freedom Fund. Here's your host, Tony Daunt. Greetings, fellow freedom fighters. This is Tony Daunt, your host of the Michigan Freedom Fund podcast, In the Trenches. Today, we've got uh, three very special guests joining us to discuss uh, the reaction to the State of the State address from Governor Whitmer last night, uh, what you saw, um, what you heard, and kind of your reaction to it. Um, so, you know, without further ado, the guests joining me are uh, Beth Deshone, Executive Director of the Great Lakes Education Project, Lynn Affendulis, Press Secretary for House Speaker Jason Wentworth, and Tori Sachs, Executive Director of Michigan Rising Action. And uh, these are three of the leading voices for conservative causes and policies in the state of Michigan. And uh, so we welcome them and look forward to, the dis to this discussion. And uh, I guess just to kick things off, um, you know, I'm curious, we'll start with you, Beth. Um, one word reaction to what you saw and heard last night and, and why that word stands out. Frustration, such a lack of taking charge on our, our children's education, um, huge missed opportunities for her to really lead and, and talk about getting our kids back in classrooms. Okay. I think that's fair. I think uh, quite a few folks felt that. Um, what about you, Lynn? What, uh, what was the one word that kind of stood out to you and why? Well, an obvious one to me is self-congratulatory. She, she, she tended to do quite a bit of uh, patting herself on the back for a number of things that uh, have occurred in the past. And um, you know, whether or not she deserved uh, some, of the, some of those accolades, this is, this is not the opportunity to look back. This is the opportunity to look forward. If you're a CEO, you establish a vision, you tell people what the vision is, you get people excited about your vision, and then you tell them how you're gonna achieve that vision. And we heard none of that. Okay, yeah, a lot of, you kind of alluded to it, a lot of focus on uh, things that, uh, bipartisan pieces of legislation that she signed, but, uh, I think if those uh, discerning will look back and realize she didn't have much to do with those pieces of legislation other than putting her signature to them. Um, well, Tori, what about you? What what stood out to you? What one word kind of um, struck you as, as a good reaction? I think lacking. And uh, you and, and you all have kind of referred to it, but her state of the state mentioned nothing about the science and data, the metrics that that her and her health department are using to continue the shutdowns. Um, I think a lot of people tuned in uh, who are still being impacted by the shutdowns, hoping to hear something, some kind of explanation and they got nothing. The other two things that were glaringly missing uh, from, from my perspective was the fact that she didn't mention nursing homes, which has been and continues to be the number one uh, location for coronavirus outbreaks uh, in the state. And then also the fact that Michigan is now leading the country uh, in unemployment job losses. We uh, had more job losses in Michigan in December than any other state. And we now have an unemployment rate of seven and a half percent, which is the 11th highest in the country. Yeah, and you that those are excellent points. And like you like you just pointed out, those tuning in um, would not would not know that if that was the first time they had kind of tuned in to, uh, to state politics over the last few months. And, uh, you know, obviously politicians don't tend to highlight negative things that happen under their watch. But, you know, I think as Lynn, you pointed out the idea of vision and, uh, you know, I think we need to recognize what the problems are before we can address them. And, um, you know, that it really, um, does strike me, uh, as you mentioned, Tori, the issue of, of the lack of, of the data and the metrics. I happen to be reading um, one of the newspapers, I think it may have been the Detroit News, uh, one of their write-ups about the governor's reaction to what the legislature did yesterday um, with, with the Senate rejecting some of her nominees and the House uh, kind of making their stand related to the recovery package and, uh, and asking um, basically pleading with the governor to work with them. Um, they've been duly elected. They, their voice needs to be heard. Um, and in that story, they asked the governor, you know, well, why aren't you releasing kind of the, the specific metrics that go with this? And, and kind of the laughable response was, well, those, those numbers lack context. And, you know, what does that say to you in terms of 
um, the governor's mindset of the people of the state of Michigan and the legislature. I, you know, for me, it says she doesn't trust people to make wise decisions on their own, that she needs to be the, the hammer that, that keeps them all locked down. I'm curious what, what each of you think of, of that and, and what that type of mindset uh, says to the people of Michigan. Yeah, Tony, I, 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 that was the thing that stood out to me from that response. She first of all said it doesn't have context. Um, and then she said, because some of these numbers might be about a new variant. And, um, and, and so we need context around that new variant. And I thought, oh, of course. This is the road we're going to go down now. Um, we, you know, we, it, it, if, as we take care of COVID, the new variant is going to become the new concern. Um, and so it says to me that she doesn't believe that she has uh, smart partners in the legislature, that we're not discerning, and not just in the legislature, but in Michigan in general. And I, I find that exceedingly concerning because to me, that is not the MO of a confident uh, chief executive. Um, you know, a confident chief executive is 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 uh, works with, uh, you know, uh, understands the smart, the, the wealth of knowledge and the wealth of experience around him or her and utilizes that and works with it and off of it. And um, instead, we're, you know, we're getting the opposite. I found that I, I found that uh, a, a troubling message from her. Yeah, I, I, same here. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad you you know, point to the issue of, of chief executives and they're, they're, you know, the good ones, um, they work with the folks around them. They know that they've got good people around them and, and uh, below them and uh, in cases above them that they need to uh, gather all the information and all the perspectives at hand and make those decisions. And we just haven't seen that. And um, you also alluded to the issue of, um, you know, kind of the, you know, the goalposts continuously being moved. And I think Beth, I, I think that, um, you know, fits quite a bit with the issue of education in this state and how um, there always seems to be a new thing that uh, is creating a reason not to get back in the classroom. And I'm curious what, you know, what you take from, from that type of message from the governor. And do we, do we really think that, um, you know, this March 1 deadline, I think it is from, from the Biden administration, do we really think given the experience thus far, that that's actually going to happen in this state? Well, you know, absolutely not, because the governor created it as sort of a soft recommendation. I mean, what we needed to hear from her, what parents and families tuned in last night to hear, just like Tori alluded to, the, the, the employees um, wanting to hear, was strength and leadership from our chief executive. We wanted to know that it was an absolute priority to get our kids safely back into classrooms all of the science and data, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatricians, countries around the world, states in this country are all doing it very safely and effectively um, and showing that kids are not transmitting the virus and, and the, the adults in those buildings are safe too. So I think it's just a continuation of what we see in the education field from a bureaucracy that believes that they know better um, and is constantly working to hide the data and not be transparent with families. Off, it's, it gets right to the point of, um, you know, like you mentioned, the, the bureaucracy and, and this unfortunate and tragic idea that the education system exists to the benefit and for the benefit of, of the adults and the administrators and, and all the various interest groups and oftentimes kids um, and their learning and their progress is the last thing that's thought about. And, um, you know, hopefully you, you've been doing a fantastic job pointing those things out and, and we applaud you and I know our, our listeners applaud you. And, um, you know, I, I would encourage those listening to, uh, to, to push your legislator, to push your superintendent, to push your school board, to, uh, to make them um, address these items, get the kids back in the classroom, think about the kids first and, uh, and, and let them know we can do this safely. And it's been done as best said throughout, uh, throughout other countries. And so, uh, you know, it, it just kind of, it, it seems like every, every piece we talk about is, you know, disappointment um, related to, to how things have gone over the last year. Um, you know, the governor made a big show. I, I, think she, I think I lost track of counting. She must have used the word bipartisan at least a dozen times and, um, you know, pointed out all the things that she signed. Um, but 
you know, again, she didn't have much to do with those items. She, she signed them because she basically had to for a budget and for auto insurance reform and what have you. Um, Tori, you know, what do you make of this, you know, what I would consider a, a head fake towards unity um, where it's just words, but it's, you know, the actions don't back that up in any fashion. Um, you know, she, she claims she wants bipartisanship and then the very next day says, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give up any power and work with the legislature. It seems to be kind of opposite messages there. Yeah, look, you know, show me, show me some action. Um, the actions she's taken recently, you know, are all political. She went to Washington, D.C. last week for Joe Biden's inauguration. Um, you know, so Michigan was still, restaurants were still closed. Uh, students can't go to school in several districts, but she could go to Washington, D.C. with thousands of people for the inauguration. You know, while Michigan still had a limit of 25 people, uh, you know, being able to be outside together, she was in an event with thousands. But then I'd also say while she was there, uh, Whitmer was also named vice chair of the Democratic National Committee. You know, you are essentially leading the National Democratic Party at that point. Um, you know, she's used, been using Joe Biden's talking points in every single speech that she's given lately, all of her press conferences. She did it again last night in the state of the state. You know, that's that doesn't speak bipartisan. That doesn't speak unity. That speaks national political party. Um, and that's just the action, actions that we're seeing. Yeah. And, and what are we, you know, what are we to make of this, um, you know, real gimmicky um you know, fix, fix the damn road ahead slogan. Um, you know, it struck me as kind of like, uh, you know, when, when there's a really good movie and, uh, and then they decide to make a sequel and the sequel is really kind of crappy. And it's just the, it's just the first one rehashed and rewarmed. Um, not to mention she still hasn't fixed the damn roads. <laughs> she promised to fix two damn months ago. Exactly. So, what are we to make of that? You know, Lynn, you know, from the, from the speaker's perspective and the legislature's perspective, um, you know, how do you address and in, in, encounter someone who, you know, is so focused on politics and is so focused on, um, on slogans and not necessarily on governing and working together? It's, it's, it's frustrating because um, it's a tactic that can work, right? I mean, you get, you get a good slogan out there and people use it and they repeat it and they use it. But, um, but it, it does at some point be, sound right and tired. And uh, I think that's what happened last night, frankly, because a lot of what she talked about was a rehash of things that had already happened um, or things that we have already discussed or things that we had already passed or not passed. And and talking about fixing the damn roads and then saying she wanted she had you know she had a plan that didn't involve going to the pump and i thought i i do recall a 45 cent gas station conversation but you know we rewrite history on a fairly regular basis and that and that can be frustrating and so what it is incumbent upon um all of us in the legislature and 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 staff and everybody to um to just continue to, you know, play this, you know, sing the same song, be, be singing from the same hymn book, um, talking about the important messages, um, making sure that we are that that we just get the get the messages out there, and it is um, important and fortunate um, that we have leadership that is ready, willing, and able to be candid uh, uh, with our messaging. And I'm finding that quite refreshing. Um, not that we haven't been in the past. There just seems to be a kind of a renewed spirit for not taking it on the chin um, and and uh, making sure that those strong messages that we need to get out are getting out there. That is the, the speaker is committed to that, to making sure that the truth is out there. Well, and, you know, we've we've all kind of pointed out some of the things that. Um, you know, we're, we find find fault with, and and that I think the the governor um, fell down on last night. Uh, you know, the things that weren't mentioned, um, Tori, you mentioned a few related to nursing homes and the unemployment rate, and and Beth, the issue of lack of uh, any kind of direction on on schools and and how to get uh, you know make that a priority. Um, you know, what are you looking for? Um, you know, Beth, we'll start with you. What are we? What are you looking for? from the legislature to um, kind of try and take back um, 
you know, what, what is theirs, this power? And, uh, you know, what should they be doing in your mind uh, to put the governor on the spot on these issues that she seems so intent on ignoring um, and then taking credit for when, uh, you know, when something happens? Well, I think we're already starting to see that, Tony, and, you know, super um, excited about the, the House package and the COVID relief package and what Representative Albert and the other bill sponsors did yesterday, um, specifically the two education bills that are going to empower families with a reimbursement um, for summer school expenses. So that there, that recognition that families are bearing a financial burden to keep their children educated when the system has failed them in many instances um, is absolutely spot on. So kudos to our House Republicans for doing that. Um, you know, and I think we're gonna continue to see conversations about accountability and assessments and what we need to do as a state to meet our children where they're at and recognize what, if any, learning loss has occurred and what do we do to ensure that interventions are put in place to recoup that. Um, so I think you'll, you'll see and hear that drumbeat, hopefully, um, from our policy committees um, and a continuation of a recognition that, that families are in control of their children's education is going to be key as well. In, in Tori, um, you know, I, I, I think you and I have, have had discussions, um, you know, just kind of among us at times about, um, you know, the, the legislature, you know, they, they are in a tough spot. They've been, um, you know, they've been boxed out by this governor. And, and you know, I think, unfortunately, um, a, in many instances, um, a, a media, is certainly national media, um, that is, you um, you know, happy to give her the benefit of the doubt at every turn. Um, but, you know, the legislature, um, they have things at their disposal they can do, um, you know, looking for, for them to maybe um, put some more things on the governor's desk and, uh, and make her um, sign them or veto them. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of good policy out there that can be, um, can be, you know, presented to the public and that the public will support what are some of those things you you would like to see uh, them put on the governor's desk, Tori? You know, late last year, uh, we'll remember Whitmer vetoed a bill that would limit the public health orders um, and repeal the governor's emergency powers. I think as people, as more people start to get engaged of, of how the orders are now impacting them, I think that's something, um, you know, to consider. Uh, it's It's... It's interesting to me that watching, you know, you and I follow this closely, but watching it through the pandemic, you know, if you weren't personally really affected by Wimmer shutdown orders at the beginning, um, you know, you, you didn't, you know, you're paying attention to other things, you're taking care of your family. Um, but now as, as these orders continue to impact more people, I think the majority of people are starting to ask themselves, what, why are these orders happening and, and what, what is it going to take? to get these orders repealed. And the fact that they're not getting any information, you know, we saw Democrat Mark Hackle from Macomb County call on this months ago. Now we're starting to see Dr. Vitti, the superintendent of Detroit Public Schools, um, call for this. You know, as the, the people who are, who are disproportionately getting affected by these shutdowns start to speak out, I think we really have to take another look at should the governor, should her health director, who by the way, resigned right after signing the most recent order, um, you know, should they really have this unilateral power without having to tell anybody why? Great question. I think, yeah, I th and I think Tori is exactly right. I do believe that um, people now, more and more people are becoming exasperated by not ha having um, at their ready uh, the, the, the data that we that we need to rely on, the plan with specific goals and strategies and metrics that we can point to and say, if this, then that. Because as she opens, as we open things up and if, as we do that without, uh, without metrics, um, you know, the concern, of course, is going to be what's it going to take to close them back down and how do we get back? And so and, and I think I think more and more people um, as their lives are impacted by this, as Tori mentioned, um, are concerned about that, are paying attention to that and are going to and are starting to demand um, that kind of information. And that's that's critical.
yeah i think you know it's this this issue of the of the 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 data and the metrics and um you know the, the lack thereof i think that really um speaks to the frustration of of so many um in particular those um you know in in the restaurant and in lodging industry and where um, you know, they, it, it seems as though they've been, you know, trying to work with the governor and, and, and so many of them put things, put processes in place to, to serve their customers safely and, uh, and, you know, extra sanitation measures. And none of that was good enough. Um, and yet they see casinos open and they see um, bowling alleys open. And then they're provided with, you know, 25% uh, open, but you got to close at 10 as if the virus, um, you know, knows what time it is and is extra vicious, uh, you know, past sundown. Um, it's, you know, it's that type of stuff that speaks to, in my mind, um, the fact that there really aren't any real data or metrics driving these. It's, it's basically what can we get away with so that when re-election comes around, we can say, well, these actions we took led to X, Y, and Z. And uh, it's it's all seems very cynical. Um, and perhaps I'm being cynical thinking of, of it that way, but um, I just find it hard to believe, you know, especially when you look around the country and uh, state of California, for instance, where, you know, one of those additional states like Michigan with extremely strict shutdown measures and very little has changed over the last month, but all of a sudden, Governor Gavin Newsom decides, well, it's time to open back up. And we're just supposed to think it has nothing to do with the gaining momentum of a recall uh, proposal out there. You know, I think it's those types of things that, that undermine faith in government that uh, groups like us are trying to, to reinstate. You know, we, we want healthy government. We want a healthy give and take. Um, you know, how do we how do we how do we work towards that? You know, Lynn, how do we how do you guys in the legislature restore some of that trust with a governor who um, vetoed an extension of unemployment benefits um, and then basically claimed that it was you know that you were lying that the legislature was lying when in fact they were the ones who were wrong and then they had to come back and and eat their words a few days later. Um, what does that say about the ability to work with them moving forward this year? Um, and when you're saying re restoring trust, you mean to restore trust between the legislature and and the governor's office? Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I mean that, that that's that's a it's that's tricky. Um, you have to have willing partners on both sides, um, and and you have to all be able. You have to be strong enough in yourselves and your positions to know uh, that you can give and take um, to make things happen. But you but that has to be there has to be a willingness on, on both sides of that. Um, there has to be a transparency and accountability in government that we're not seeing right now um, and that we haven't seen for a while. And I think, you know, with those tools and those things in place, um, it becomes easier to trust each other if, if there is accountability and if we do have um, if we do have transparency it's it's uh, and, and those those are going to be key and they have they are priorities of this legislature and the speaker so I'm pleased about that yeah awesome now you know we've we've talked about the state of the state um, you know we've talked about um, some of the things um, that we'd like to see the legislature do. Um, you know, to, to, you know, exp take their message to the people. Um, you know, any, any thoughts from, from this group on um, maybe some, some more creative ideas on, on ways to, to go, um, you know, around or, or above the governor and uh, on kind of the traditional media outlets, ways that, um, that conservatives can take their message directly to, to the people um, with what we stand for and uh, and what you know what we're doing to make their lives better any anything that maybe you know the folks just aren't thinking about that they that would do well for maybe Lynn to take back to the speaker I mean I think what the oversight committees in both the house and the senate are doing uh, has been great you know this morning they had um people folks in from the MHSAA and others who who want to let the kids play who aren't but then also say what the um, 
the, um, the engagement level from the coaches, the superintendents, the players themselves, you know, tweeting hashtag, let them play or hashtag, let us play is really taken over Twitter um, to an extent that, you know, to see this many people who are not traditionally engaged in a legislative or political process, trying to make their voice heard uh, to the governor. And a lot of these, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old kids, um, are really doing that. And I think those are the types of things that we have to help promote, um, you know, the people who are really being impacted by this. And Beth, from, from a schooling standpoint, you're a, oftentimes a, a lone voice in the wilderness about these issues. What do you have to say re- regarding, you know, the fact that, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not discounting the importance of this, obviously, but, you know, the fact that it's, it's the athletics um, that are really getting people uh, riled up and and yet we've had a year of lost learning. Um, you know, how do you, you know, how do you reconcile the fact that that's what's working, but you know, the real issue is our kids aren't learning right now. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as Tori said, obviously pa- passions are boiling over as it relates to our student athletes. And as a parent of, of two athletes, it, you know, it breaks my heart also um, what's happening to them. So we've got to meet these parents and these, these students where they are um, and, and engage them on that understanding that, you know, the, the push to get them back in the classroom, um, even though they're not necessarily vocal on it as they are about the sports right now, it is important. Um, you know, I find families and moms especially um, are, you know, we talk amongst our groups and that that frustration level of parents and, you know, families that are deciding if they're quitting a job so one can stay home and educate the kids or, you know, they're pulling their hair out trying to help with math homework. Um, or a math assignment while they're cooking dinner, um, or they're not able to be there to support their students because they are required to go to work to put food on the table. These are not decisions families should need to be facing. So really continuing that call to get kids back in classrooms and get them into school um, as an option and and allow that remote learning to continue for families that have embraced it and, and can deal with it. Um, that that's really going to be the first step we can take. Yeah. I just real quick want to jump on that. The uh, Detroit superintendent made a good point when he said that, you know, a large percentage of Detroit parents and teachers um, still fear, you know, returning to in-person learning and the kind of messaging from Whitmer saying that sports isn't safe, but yet they're, they're expected to send their kids back and go back to teaching, you know, gym class, things like that um, is, is not helpful. Uh, in getting kids and and parents ready to go back to school in person. And my last point I want to make is that the the families who have the funds to take their kids to play sports uh, in Ohio, in Indiana, in Wisconsin, all these states that are open, those families are already doing that. The kids who can afford to leave the state to go play, um, you know, in hopes of a college scholarship, they've been doing that for, for weeks, if not months now. Um, and it's, and that's only growing that the people who are hurt here, um, disproportionately are the kids that can't afford to do that. And the families that can't afford to travel out of state to play. And those are the same people who can't afford to send their kids to in-person learning at the private schools that are open right now and have been for the entire pandemic. So I think these, you know, Gretchen Wimmer likes to talk about equity. She likes to talk about helping people who are disproportionately affected. Her orders are disproportionately affecting people who need these these services from the government. I mean, school, we're talking about school. Um, You know, those are the people who are getting impacted by this all the most. Tough to argue with that. I I feel like we should should end there because that's a strong message. And I'm I'm considering a a draft Tory Sachs for governor based on that message right there. So (laughs) I don't... I don't know what you've got planned over the next couple of years, but keep your options open, Tori. Yeah, four little kids. I might have to educate them at home, Tony. <laughs> well, I um, I appreciate the time from from each of you and uh, and the work that you do for the state of Michigan for for conservative causes and for um, you know getting government you know working to get government out of the way and allow people. To uh, to thrive, uh, individual liberty, and um, in in making decisions that are best for them, and uh, I look forward to uh, additional conversations with each of you moving forward, and um, you know hopefully uh, be chatting with you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thanks, Tony. Great to be with you, Beth and Lynn. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in the trenches. To learn more about the Michigan Freedom Fund, please visit our website at www.michiganfreedomfund.com and sign up for our weekly email, The Frontlines of Freedom. In the Trenches is available on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, and SoundCloud. If you enjoy this podcast, please tell your friends. Thank you for listening.